to the Where the hot winds blow across the desert country near the Grand Canyon in Arizona lives the Hopi or Tuzayan Indian. We were led to believe in the early days all Indians were warlike. But you never heard of a Hopi raiding party. As they are known as the peaceful people. Who are the Hopi and what is their background? Their homes made of stones appear to be part of a native cliff and rise out of the desert a monument to a race which has survived famine and onslaughts from enemies to live useful and productive lives. At first glance, the pueblos seem to have no order, but closer scrutiny reveals that these dwelling streets and three mesas and the uneven surface of the plateaus has in turn caused the pueblos to be erected with some irregularity. But notwithstanding, here is the original apartment building of the United States. Situated a mile and a quarter above sea level, they are not easily reached and have served for years as barriers to the warlike tribes surrounding them. Indeed, the Spanish conquerors discovering the Hopi in 1540 were halted by the inaccessibility of these elevated homes. And it was the Hopi himself who offered to submit to the conquistadores. The constant wind that blows, sometimes bringing sand, and the many feet of human beings and later burrows have worn smooth the rocks of this street. Existence amid this sandy waste is probably more difficult than anywhere else in our country, as rainfall is very scarce. But the Hopi does not entirely rely upon the winter snows and the occasional summer thunderstorm to irrigate his land. His system of irrigation is well planned and very effective if one doesn't mind lifting water. Taken from a spring, the water starts its downward journey to the parched soil and thirsty beans. Because of the lack of vegetation, wild game has never been plentiful and the Hopi has become, through scarcity, more of a vegetarian than most Indians. Squash is another vegetable that seems to withstand the sun and hot winds and reaches a notable size. They also cultivate several kinds of fruit, such as apples, peaches, and pears, and have very successful crops which are dried and stored. They are indebted for some of their fruit trees to the Spanish friars, who in 1700 were tossed over the cliffs because they interfered with Hopi religious beliefs. This is the only record of violence against the Hopi. The women use this fruit when dried in many clever ways, and visitors to Hopi land say the menu is far from monotonous. While beans and squash are two popular vegetables with the Hopi, Corn is always first in his diet. Given corn and a stream, he can live and prosper. The Hopi plants corn much the same as the Navajo, about 20 seeds to a hill. In this way, the inner stalks will be protected from the dryness of the desert. Famine has taught the Hopi many a costly lesson, and he will always take care that he has at least a year's supply stowed away. Laziness is not tolerated among the Hopi, and the work is quite evenly distributed. It may seem odd that this woman has assumed the laborious task of chopping the stumps into fire lengths, but the men must see that the wood is hauled up inclines, ladders, and stepping stones, and place it near the pueblos. The men do the planting and most of the hoeing of crops, while all the grinding of corn falls to the woman. As a little girl, a Hopi woman is trained to ply the grinding stones until when she has reached maturity, she apparently grinds with such ease we do not guess what back-breaking work this can be. 
Perhaps nowhere in the world grows such colorful corn as that raised by the Hopi. Their legends tell of the origin of the blue grain, yellow, and so on. But the real reason is probably as mysterious as the sands of the painted desert on which they live. The favorite bread is the piki, or paper bread, which is made by smearing a batter of corn meal over a slab of heated stone. Afterwards, it is rolled. This, too, requires cultivated skill to keep from burning the fingers while spreading the paste. This bread serves another important purpose. When a couple have intentions of marrying, the girl bakes a batch of piki bread, which she takes to her future mother-in-law's house. And it is sampled by all the male members of the household. The eating of the bread signifies that she is accepted by his family. Then the head washing ceremony takes place. The mother-in-law of each washes their heads in yucca suds. And it is at this time that the groom may withdraw if he does not wish to go through with the marriage. Evidently, this couple have no intentions of that sort. And when the hair is rinsed and dried, the mother-in-law of the bride will dress her hair in matron fashion. Then their friends will join in the wedding breakfast. And afterwards, the real preparations will start. The groom and various members of his clan will weave garments. The weaving usually takes place in one of the kivas, or lodge rooms. And the apparel will consist of a wedding sash, one large blanket, and one smaller blanket, all made from white cotton. This man is making the wedding sash. A pair of white moccasins, reaching almost to the knees and requiring a whole deerskin, also will be made. The bride has been living at the groom's house while her wardrobe was being completed. And now she is ready to return to her parents' home, where they will live until they erect one of their own. On leaving, the groom's parents give the young couple some very good advice. <laughs> The bride is dressed in her wedding robe and carries the one blanket and sash in the reed suitcase. The fringe hanging from her burden denotes falling rain and means that she is prepared for the next world, as the Hopi does believe in life after death. The bride's parents give them a warm welcome and her wedding garments are examined and admired. The bride will put away her robe until the snake dance takes place in July, when all the brides of the year appear and participate. Just before she enters the dance, her father-in-law fastens a roll of black yarn to the back of her robe. This is her marriage certificate, the last rite that indicates she is now legally married. She may wear the robe once more at the naming ceremony of her first child. Then no more will she appear in it, as it is to be kept for her burial. The Hopi believe that her soul will spread this robe on the ground at the edge of the Grand Canyon. And as she steps upon it, she will float to the bottom, where she will find the home of Hopi souls.